Mikey doll. And my titties in there. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back again. Chalk Talk, episode nine. Today we're gonna to talk about auto-regulating training and what that means. In the episode, we're gonna talk about what is auto-regulation, what is periodization, how to use RP and what RP systems are, and how to modify a training plan. Hope you guys enjoy. Enjoy the show. meaningful discussion on what auto-regulating training means. We have to understand what is auto-regulation and then what is training. So first, let's talk about the traditional paradigm of training. We can think of, uh, or like when we think of traditional training for powerlifting, first strength training, we think of either linear periodization or block periodization. So in other words, uh, we do a certain weight and at a certain set in reps on week one. So for example, we do five sets of five and 100 pounds in week one. And then week two, we do five sets of five at 110 pounds. So we add 10 pounds the following week. And then week three, we do five sets of five at 120 pounds. So in other words, we keep the sets and reps fixed and then we add a certain amount of weight each week and we just do that for as long as we can sustain that. And that is linear, linear progression. Another way of thinking about it is, is say, one month we were doing uh, sets of six to 10 reps in the 60 to 75% range. So, so say in week one we do three sets of 10 at 60%, week two, three sets of eight at 65%. So we add, add weight and then we decrease the amount of reps. And then in week three we do three sets of six at 70%. And then we, we deload after that and then we start another block and now we're working in the 75 to 85% range. And we can sort of Think of you're working in training in these specific blocks bounded by these intensity ranges. But that this is this is just for the sake of defining our terms. So we have linear periodization, and then that was an example of block periodization. Now, as we're aware, it's like block periodization has been developed as a way for for really high-level athletes to make a long-term training plan for the for training for the Olympics, for example. So if you're an Olympic weightlifter and you have your sights set on this like the pinnacle of competition in four years, you probably have hired a bunch of coaches who really know their stuff and they, they want to give you this idea that over the next four years, this is what our long-term long plan looks like. However, as we're aware, if you're not a full-time athlete, the likelihood that your life is going to revolve around your training is very low because you have work, you have family, you have relationships, you have social obligations, and you have all these other things that that may rank higher on the priority list than you know having a higher one rep max in your squat bench and deadlift, which is totally fine because as 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 me and Cox and Rob, this is this is our hobby. It's something we enjoy, but at the end of the day, it's still our hobby. And the likelihood that any of us will be professionals in powerlifting that will be paid a good amount of money just to train and compete in powerlifting is extremely low. So, I don't should be a hobby. Uh, talk for yourself over there. <laughs> they, don't, they don't even pay the professionals now, so hey, yeah. we're doing yeah, okay. It's all, it's it's all been down yeah. since two years ago. <laughs> but, uh, was I getting in with that? You were calling us not professionals. Yeah, so we're not, we're not professionals about this. <laughs> and, and the likelihood that we'll have a four-year plan written out for us that we're going to follow to the T because our livelihood depends on it is just simply unrealistic and irrational to think that, that that's even possible. So, so we have like that, that model, that old model of here's the long-term plan, but when you have like stress about money, when you have kids, when you have work, when you have all these other obligations that rank higher than powerlifting, or even, even like you're getting sick or you have allergies or you didn't eat as much the night before, or you didn't sleep as much the night before, like there are these things that will influence your training and make training more or less difficult that we need to account for if we want to have the most uh, like the most success in our training. So that's periodization and then we this is what introduces the idea of auto-regulation. So put simply when we wake up every day we wake up with a certain sort of health score. So that is the, the combination of how well you slept the night before how well you ate, how well you hydrated, what is your stress level, are you, are you, 
arguing with your spouse? Are you stressing about money or are you totally relaxed and, uh, and you feel really recovered and, and there's no injuries you're dealing with and things like that? And you add up all those things and that sort of determines what your readiness is for a given day. And some people measure this objectively or try to measure this as objectively as possible with things like, like amount of sleep, uh, calories taken in, what is your heart rate variability for that given day. Other people, they have a more intuitive sense of how they feel on a given day. So some people, they just wake up and they're like, you know what, I feel pretty crappy today. Normally I feel pretty rested, but today I'm feeling pretty, pretty crappy. Versus, oh, I know I got my eight hours of sleep and I feel really great. There's no brain fog at all. I feel, I feel ready. And, and first, identifying what your readiness is for a given day, that's step one. And then step two is how, do, how does that apply to your training? And that is where auto-regulation comes into play. So, so when we think of powerlifting and training, or powerlifting and auto-regulating training, the first thing that tends to come to mind is the RPE scale, or uh, that's an acronym for Rating of Perceived Exertion. So, Cox, would you like to define RPE for us? RPE, in my terms? Yeah. Rate of perceived exertion. Oh, yeah. what, what, it's what, his turn again. What do, you, <laughs> what do you think RPE is? RPE is a, can be difficult, but is, is a system that is set up to simply, um, it's, a, it's a way that you can judge how hard you push in a lift or a certain movement and use that as a scale to kind of guide you progressing or um, retracting a little bit in your weights, rep schemes, whatever it may be. But it's a, it's a system that kind of helps you guide how, how hard you're actually pushing. Like I gave 90% to that lift. Essentially, that would be an RPE 9, roughly. Um, and it's just a, it's an easy guideline to follow. Um, and each lift is going to be different too. Like a, a RPE 8 deadlift might look a little bit more difficult than an RP8 bench or vice versa or, or whatnot. So it's definitely uh, it's definitely to that certain lift as well. It's gonna it's gonna be how hard you perceive something on that given day. It's kind of how I look at it. Like you know how we've all come to the gym and you hit a certain weight on squat and it moves like the bar's empty and then you hit a certain weight on squat or that same weight on squat two weeks later and it's a little bit slower and you're like man that felt heavy today. <laughs> So it's like measuring it off your day to day. That's why there's like a, the RPE scale. So you can judge off how you kind of feel that day and then you know judge your training around that. And it works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. Um, some people ego lift a little bit too much so the RPE scale never will work. Some people undercut it and want to make sure they never miss anything and then it's you know then it's undercut the whole time. So it's, uh, it's very specific to the person. And then, you know, some people enjoy training away and absolutely love it and see a lot of results on it. Some people struggle with it a little bit. And, and so the RPE scale is based off of the Borg scale, which was which is like this thing that rates the difficulty of a task on a scale of 1 to 10. However, in applied or as applied to powerlifting, the RPE scale would typically rate a set as an RPE 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. And that means, so working backward, RPE 10 means that that set was two failure, you had zero reps in the tank. RPE 9 stands for you have one rep in the tank. So say you did you did a triple and the last one was pretty hard, but you were pretty sure you could have done one more, that was an RPE 9. Whereas if you think you could have done two more, that would be an RPE 8, and so on and so forth. So RPE 6 means you had four reps in the tank. And that's our way of, like nothing will ever be truly objective, but this is, one way we can impose objectivity on how we uh, perceive our training. And, and as Rob said, sometimes it works for people, sometimes it doesn't. And the reason why for some people it doesn't really work is because we can think of rating your training or rating the difficulty of your training as a skill. And if when you come into the gym, what you do is, is like you look around the gym, you see who's lifting the heaviest weight, and you're like, I'm gonna squat five more pounds than that. <laughs> then the likelihood that you're gonna, you're going to be able to rate your training objectively is less because you, what's important to you is not so much like gauging accurately how difficult that set was. It's more of a, I want to be the strongest person in the gym. And and if we try to pair that with this objective skill of, or this seemingly objective skill of rating an RPE, 
then it, it doesn't tend to work well together. In the same way that, it's like, say you're teaching someone all the cues in a squat and goblet squat, and then without ramping them in, you just have them max out and try to nail all 10 of the cues they just learned. It's not really that problem. If you teach someone like RPE, and then you have them do their, their most difficult sets of the day, the likelihood that they're going to be able to rate their RPE isn't that great. So in, in applying RPE in our training, we can think of it as a skill and a skill that we can, we can practice with sort of every set that we do. And like one way is to, like, is to standardize your RPE scale. So it's defined as how far away, or like your proximity to failure. So if you can have a person, if, you, if you're planning on having one of your athletes start training with RPEs, you can have them work up to a three rep max or a, a conservative three rep, three rep max. And then as they're working up in sets of three, so say they're, they're planning to work up to three sets of, or a set of three at 185 in their, in their bench press, for example. So when they're warming up, they do 135 for three, and they're probably like, you know, this is less than an RP six. I could have done six more reps. And then they do 155 for three. And then they're like, oh, this is getting a little hard, but I could probably do do four. I could do four more reps. And then they do a set of three at 185, and they're like, oh, that was tough. I could have done one more rep, so that was an RPE nine. And then you have them work up a little heavier, so like 195 for three. And they're like, oh, I didn't have any more in the tank. That was a ten. And you, as coach, are watching them do the triples, and you're like, okay, that looked like this RPE. And then they they give you the feedback of, yeah, it felt like I could have done X amount of reps in the tank so that you can have this agreement and calibration of your RPE scale instead of just saying, you know what, I think if I play the right Rocky song or, or whatever that I could have gotten more, even though the technique could have looked like crap, I could have done more. And I think it's like first define the RPE as how many more reps could you have done, but then also how many reps could you have done with good technique? Because it doesn't really matter if you can do one really textbook rep in the squat and get four cat back or, or super round back good morning squats because those those following through reps aren't going to meaningfully or positively influence your technique going forward. So if you do one rep, for example, where textbook or te technique is really textbook, but then the following through you're really crappy, and then you're reinforcing that crappy movement pattern, and that's not the point of training. Training, we're supposed to train with good technique so that we can express that good technique in competition. And that covers RPE. That that's like a like when we think of powerlifting again, we think of RPE, and that is a way, of, or that's how we define it, and that's a way we can meaningfully practice it. Now. On a, on a larger scale or a more applicable scale, uh, how do we use auto-regulating in, in, like in, the training pro, in, in the training process? So say we have a plan and we have like this three-week block where I'm supposed to increase 5% every week and, and I hope that technique is going to hold up, but say on certain days you're feeling pretty good and other days you're not feeling that good. So say on a given day you have three sets of 10 at 60%, but you got a poor night's sleep. Rob, how would you <laughs> adjust that training plan? <laughs> I was in the middle of yawning when you said sleep. So <laughs> yeah. or, or, like, yeah. or like, what are the various tools that we have in our toolbox to, to regulate training? Come in, first set goes bad, you scrap everything, you throw your belt, you leave and go home. Yeah, you don't even you rack don't your train weights. That day. Shit! Oh, you definitely rack your weights. <laughs> Leave the green plates on everything. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. Um, there's a few different ones. It just depends on, it, right? It's real athlete specific, but just for the sake of what we're talking about, you come in and you know, you're supposed to, I don't know what numbers you kind of put down there, but let's say, you know, let's just say you're, you're going for tens and you only get eight on your second set. Um, we can, we can bring it down 10%. So the weight's a little less instead of doing tens that day, we could just stick with eights. So we're training good technique with all eight reps instead of eight reps really good and two really, really shitty ones. Um, we can bring it down a little more if we need to. We can flip it. So instead of doing, you know, uh, five sets at eight, we can do eight sets of five. A little less rep per set, but we can get really, really crisp reps and we're still getting like the accumulative same volume in for the day. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do if it's feeling that bad and, you know, you bring all that down and you didn't feel like you trained too hard then, you can kind of push the accessories a little bit. So make sure you, you know, you're getting some good work in, in the gym. You made it all the way down here, you might as well. 
it's just the answer is not you know kick the knee sleeves off throw the belt I'm done for the day because I feel like shit I'm out of here it's just like staying and choosing a different option whether it be back off you know re no, I wouldn't say re warm up back off work on technique and work your way back up bring down the percentage invert it there, there's a ton of different answers besides just scrapping it for the day and saying I feel bad I'm going home yeah. And there's definitely, I mean, that comes into the whole consistency thing. There's going to be days where you come into the gym and you just feel like complete ass. Um, your your squats went bad, whatever you're doing that day. Just the whole start of the day went bad. And sometimes you might have to drop more than 5 or 10%. And that's okay. It's not going to ruin your training for the whole week. It's not going to ruin your progress or anything like that. It's not going to, you know, slow things that much if you have a day that's really off and you just you can't focus at all and you have to drop, you know, half your reps off or whatever it may be. There's going to be days where it's just that that's what you have to do to get by. Some's better than none. Some is better than none. And like if you're noticing that you have to come into the gym and auto-regulate everything every single day and you're like, you know, I can meaningfully practice that. I can I can gauge my RPEs every day and I'm really good at that. It's like that that's good, but it's like we have to take a step back and and ask why do I have to auto-regulate every day? Is my coach not listening to me? Or are my like, like external variables, so like my diet, sleep, nutrition, are those are those really inconsistent? I'm just like an inconsistent human being and I'm trying to do this this uh, this hobby that requires some degree of, of consistency. And it's <laughs> like, should I focus on, on auto-regulation or should I focus on, you know, getting eight hours of sleep per night? Or you know, like, can I use auto regulation to justify my shitty, shitty lifestyle habits? Right? <laughs> no. And, and some, it can't be that I drunk all night. And yeah. and it's like, I mean, it's for for some people, their their lifestyle is is very fixed in place, and we we have no place in in telling them how to to do things outside of training. However, if auto regulation is a band aid to the larger issue of inconsistency in, in hydration and nutrition and sleep, then like. Us as coaches, we can only do so much to, to make up for that. But I figure something we can we can sort of conclude with is is even the greatest powerlifting coach on planet Earth, Boris Shako, even he auto regulates training on a daily basis for his athletes, and he's coached the most amount of world champions in the world. So, but it works for him because he is at a gym, and all his all of his athletes come to his gym, and he watches them train in person every single day. If you're working with an online coach and and they don't see how your technique breaks down as you do more sets or, or how poor sleep or poor nutrition or poor hydration impacts your training, they can't really make a call on how to adjust your training unless you are really good at communicating that to them. And oftentimes that's not the case because it's, it's like, oh, it's, it's, this program is written for me, I paid money for it, so you know, I'm just gonna like grit my teeth and get through it. and. And I don't want them to see me as soft or weak because I paid for it and you know, I'm going to see it through. And oftentimes we're too proud to communicate to our coach that it's like what's written on the plan, it, it might be a little too difficult for me and it's only week one and you expect me to do a couple more weeks of this. Maybe I'm just going to, you know, like do it again for another week and then kind of burn out by week three and then like not communicate with the coach at all and, and then like tell them so many weeks later that, oh, I'm coach, uh, Training was really hard. I got kind of burnt out. <laughs> that, that, that line of transparency from the start in communicating the difficulty of training, not in a way of that like can be a blow to the ego, but can be more of a, you know what, this is week one, but it was really like an RPE 10 every single day. And that that's really that's, that was way too difficult for me. And even though I'm, I'm not really good at rating RPEs, I know what's like a really difficult training session and what's a more manageable one. And I'm not going to be able to, to sustain this for two more weeks after this. And as a coach, I mean, if you don't communicate with us, we can't give you the best information and the best workouts and the best the best system that works for you. If you don't communicate, we can't help you. And as coaches, if we can like establish as many redundant ways for us to communicate as possible, while also finding like this athlete likes to communicate their their training session in RPEs, this athlete likes to communicate their training. In these in these like video journals, they keep on Instagram. This this athlete likes to send me emails after every training session. This, this athlete likes to write their training sessions in the training journal, where they can sort of gather their thoughts 
in the in the midst of a training session where their emotions are high and they're not really thinking that clearly, and then they, they like read their journal at night to sort of put into more objective words what what happened that day, and then they they send that to their coach. Like find what works for for the athlete or for yourself, and then find a way to take as much of the emotion out of it as possible so that you can so you instead of saying like oh it was an RP10 because. I was fighting with my boyfriend or because I didn't sleep that well it's like okay I was doing all that but it's be and that made it so I couldn't focus on balancing over midfoot or I couldn't focus on my bracing because I was having allergies that day I couldn't breathe through my nose or I was feeling really hydrated or I was feeling really dehydrated and when I came into that training session my, my body started cramping up so I couldn't really focus on my technique I had to focus on like my body was spasming mid-session so this, I, just as we're doing here, we're defining what is auto-regulating, we're defining what, what are these certain types of periodization. If we can define what are the metrics you use to gauge the difficulty of a training session, we can give both coach and athlete a language, or yeah, a shared language yeah. they can use to discuss their training. Versus just hoping that, oh, this person is really crappy at communicating, therefore they can't communicate with me as coach because they, they didn't do well in grammar school. Hey. <laughs> Hey. What do you mean, you people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Any concluding thoughts? That's pretty good right there. Covered a ton on RPE and what the definition is. and then Did uh, we want to go over, the or is this a different episode, um, when to use RPE as like a coach in a training block for a client? Or oh, that's a good when one. And w when and where. I've noticed, at least for me, um, when I've noticed that the RPE scale is most effective, at least for me, is a lot of people use it for their heavy lifts, their singles, doubles, triples because uh, they can get a good judgment on how much they got left. You video and you can really see how, how much strength you have left in your legs or something like that. Yeah. But if you're in the middle of, like, say, a volume block and you've got plenty of time before you ever think about maxing out again or anything like that, using the RPE scale to judge a weight, so say week one you're going to do 10 at an RPE 7 on your bench. The next week do 10 at an RPE 8, 10 at an RPE 9. It's a really good way to judge strength and growth over a period of time without having to max out. Uh, and I'm, there's many other methods of using RPE too, if you want to touch on those. Should I put a monkey in the wrench? Wrong, monkey do the wrench. Wrong, do, do it. it. Do wrench. Wrench I fucking monkey. hate RPE. <laughs> I fucking hate RPE. What do you hate about RPEs? I don't feel like I can judge them fairly, even with myself. And I know my body pretty well. And I think it's just really hard to judge for me. <clears throat> and when I was like, uh, when I was like coming up and learning lifting and stuff, um, like, as long as the technique, for me, this is for me, don't apply this if it doesn't apply to you. Uh, as long as the technique doesn't break down and you're still training with good technique and do these things, I like, I believe that, like, I've had nights with bad sleep, I've had nights where I'm up late, I've had, like, my best training sessions off the worst, like, no eating or something like that. And I'm not saying it's something you should thrive to sustain. There's that bell, and we tried to beat it, and we <laughs> did it. This one's going long. Here it comes. Church is in session. Um... I've had training sessions that were fine off of having really, really bad variables like bad sleep and things like that. And for me, I've just learned like, this is the program, you come in, you execute it. As long as you're not like training with shit technique and all these things are happening, it's okay to push a little bit for me. And that's what works for me. Yeah. It's just the RP, I just feel like I cannot judge it that well, even for myself, I, I can't. And I think that's a, that's a huge assumption, like that you can execute the training with good technique. It's a huge assumption, like wrong. You, we have been training for quite a bit. You take a beginner and you tell them that, they're like, I don't know what my technique is. Or they're like, my technique is always good. Yeah, <laughs> Stay ready, don't gotta get ready. Yeah, and then they're good morning every single squat. Like, oh, yeah, it's really good, good technique. So, yeah, so like I can feel my technique break down. And if it is, obviously I'm having, you know, a bad day and that number for the day is a little bit, you know, over my RP, it's a little too high and I'm not gonna be able to hit these sets with good techniques of their shit. So I, I might invert it, I might bring it down 10%. But for me, that that's just kind of how it works. Um, I just, it, the RP is a little hard for me. And I'm, you know, I'm, it's kind of an experienced lifter and it's a challenging thing. So I don't think it works for every single person. No, definitely not. Like it works on my bench and, or sorry, it works on my squat, my deadlift. My bench, 135, 185, 225, they all move at the same speed. Don't know why. I'm super slow. <laughs> it's really hard to judge RP when everything is paced the same and you don't see yourself fatiguing as you go along. And I've, I've coached some beginners who picked up RPE immediately and I've worked with some really high level athletes who, who's, who still can't gauge RPE. And I know some, some like 
some world champions who who are not comfortable with gauging RPE in their training because the way I like to think about it is is like their their psychology in engaging their training is is not it's not the most stable I guess you could say or not the most consistent so so if uh, if you if, if like your perception of training is just so is sort of out of touch with what's physically going on then then like st staying more strict with percentage based training is probably s is smarter is probably more is going to be more consistent and going to yield more predictable results uh, however like some I I've done this and I, I coach some athletes like this like having a linear progression of RPE week to week so it's like like Cox said so week one you do 10 into 7 week two you do 10 into 8 week three you do 10 into 9 it's, it's kind of like you could also write that as whatever you do for a set of 10 on week one you add 5 to 10 pounds for week two Pretty you much. add 5 to 10 pounds for week three yep. and you don't have to have an RPE in there however it could be like you, you add 5 to 10 pounds in week week two and then you get to week three and, and like it's week three of volume and if anyone has, has done three weeks of volume they know how destroyed their body feels by the end of week three and then you have a, a set of 10 at an RPE 9 on week three you, like what you did for your last warm up in week one it's probably going to feel like that because your body is so beat up but not always sometimes you might you might feel better and stronger or maybe the maybe that you know that 10 there feels <laughs> like uh, lighter than your first week yeah and you're like oh my gosh i can go up a little bit yeah and and then like that is this sort of meta skill of in the moment identifying the state of your body and the state of your nervous system and then sort of how prepared you are for training so that you can really determine honestly as honestly as possible my body is capable of lifting this much weight today this is what i'm going to do or like i'm going to dose my my numbers accordingly because like if you've competed before you know that not all competitions are created equal how you how you show up to each competition will be different whether it be because of travel because you're not eating normal food because you you stress out more around training or around competition time and like sometimes you have a plan and it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna set a 10 kilo PR in this competition, but then you get there and you hit your last warm up and your first attempt, and they feel like your third attempt, and you're like I don't know what's going on. My training was going really well, but it seems like on this day I'm not capable capable of as much as I had hoped for. How am I gonna adjust the plan, or will I adjust the plan, or am I just gonna stick with it and be like, you know what? I set this goal on this this 10 kilo PR. I'm gonna go for it, even though I'm probably gonna miss my second third attempt. And if we can refine that skill as early as possible and one way we can refine that skill is in practicing RPEs honestly and like with the guidance of coach and then that is how when that time does eventually come we'll, we can be ready for it. Yep, yeah. that's not bad. I like that. Close it out, Zach. I think that's a good finisher. Well, for me and the boys in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. This is our, uh, I the believe, local church. I believe ninth episode so we just passed the two month mark. We're having a good time doing this, hopefully reaching some people. And if you're not already, please go get out, go to the local gym, throw some weight around, throw some chalk around, just try and be better than you were the day before. Mm -hmm. so this is Coximus, Edward, and Rob signing off. Out.